The Eyes of the Killer Robot by John Belair's Chapter 11. Once again, the maroon Pontiac was bumping along the ruddy road that led up the side of Mount Creed. The professor gripped the steering wheel hard and he cursed every time the car hit a bump. Fergie sat beside him and the look on his face showed that he was frightened but determined. They were going much too fast on this winding road and sometimes the car skidded very close to the edge when the professor rounded a curve. But Fergie didn't complain. He knew they were in a desperate hurry he only hoped that they were going the right, in the right direction. After they had careened around a tight hairpin turn, the professor began to slow down. Up ahead of them, a car was parked in the middle of the road. Ha! said the professor as he put on the brakes and turned off the engine. I'll bet you that's old Sloan's car. Who else would be up on this godforsaken mountain at this time of night? Well, that proves that we've come to the right place. And in case there's any doubt in your mind, it also proves that Sloan is no ghost. Ghosts don't need cars to take them from one place to the next. All right, everybody out. We're going the rest of the way on foot. Fergie and the professor got out and edged past the rusty, or the old rusty Chevrolet, moving quickly. The clouds had cleared and the moon was out, and this helped them see where they were going. The road had stopped winding and climbed straight up the side of the mountain. Dark masses of brushes and trees loomed on both sides. I, I wish I had brought a weapon of some kind. The professor gasped as he paused to catch his breath. The jack handle, we might have been able to use it. It's a heck of a time to be thinking about that, grumbled Fergie as he wiped his forehead with his sleeve. By the way, do you think we're getting close? It's hard to tell in the dark. The professor squinted into the, the, professor squinted into the gloom. I can't positively be sure, but I think the house is around the curve up there. You see it? Way up ahead? Fergie nodded. I guess so. Okay. I've got my wind back, so let's get moving. You all right? The professor grinned. Except for nervous prostration, exhaustion, and a fierce ache in my side, I'm in great shape, he said. Forward at the gallop. Fergie and the professor started to run. They both had the feeling that something awful was going to happen to Johnny, and they wanted to get to the house as fast as they possibly could. As they drew cl closer to the curve in the road, they saw that the professor had been right. There was, there was the grassy field glimmering in the moonlight. And in the distance, the shadowy house waited. But there was something standing in the field near the edge of the road. A post? No. It was someone with a rifle in his hands. Fergie and the professor stopped running. Cold fear swept over them. And they glanced quickly at each other. With crunching sounds, the figure moved closer. And now they could see it was a teenager, a boy who was maybe 15 years old. He had a pimply face and a crew cut, and he looked mean. Okay, you two, he yelled. That's as far as you go. Back off. The professor clenched his fist. He could feel anger welling up inside him. Up inside him, With an effort, he managed to keep calm. Young man, he said in a strange voice, you must have a lot of spare time on your hands. I mean, here you are with a gun in your hands, guarding a deserted empty house. May I ask why? House isn't deserted, snapped the boy as he waved the rifle around to show that he meant business. It belongs to Mr. Oglesby, and he pays me to look after the place. He called me up from his gas station and he said for me to come up here about 10 o'clock and keep people away, and I do what he tells me to do, so get moving or you'll be sorry. Fergie looked at the professor. Who's Oglesby? He whispered. That must be the name Sloan is using, the professor muttered, and he added nastily, I'd like to wring that kid's neck. He thinks he's the king of the hill and that wretched piece of art with that wretched piece of artillery in his hands. Huh? What'd you say? Asked the boy in a threatening voice. None of your business, snapped Fergie. There was a silence for a moment. The boy stood, tensely gripping the rifle in his hands, while Fergie and the professor stood several paces away watching him. Finally, Fergie stepped forward. He looked the boy up and down contemptuously and folded his arms. Okay, you, he said loudly. Are you really going to shoot us if we try to get past you? Are you that dumb? You shoot us and you'll get tossed in jail for the rest of your life. How'd you like that? How'd you like for that to happen, huh? The boy stiffened. Who are you calling dumb, you long-nosed goop? You say that to me again and I'll punch your face in. You and who else, said Fergie in a taunting voice. I bet you couldn't fight your way out of a paper bag. As the professor watched in amazement, the boy threw down the rifle and rushed at Fergie. Swearing, he lunged at Fergie's throat, but Fergie ducked to one side and landed a punch to the boy's stomach. They started rolling around in the grass, kicking and snarling. Quickly, the professor sprang forward. He picked up the rifle, slid the bolt back, and dumped the bullet out. Then he threw the rifle down and tried to break up the fight. 
The pimply-faced kid had a cut lip and some red marks on his face. Had enough? snarled Fergie. He raised his right fist in the air threateningly. All right, you two, barked the professor. The fight's over. There are more important things to attend to. Break it up. He bent over and grabbed Fergie by the shoulders. But at that moment, something happened. From the underbrush across the road came a loud crackling and crunching. Boughs swayed and bent, and suddenly a large man-sized shape lurched out into the middle of the road. In an instant, the professor guessed. Oh, my God, he gasped. It's the robot. Swaying uncertainly, the thing looked around. In the moonlight, it was hard to tell, but it looked like a big husky man with a shock of blonde hair on his head. The robot had taken the shape of what it had taken on the shape that it had when it struck out Clutch Clem in the summer of 1900. Run, everybody, run! yelled the professor in a panicky voice. That thing isn't human, and if it catches you, it'll kill you. For God's sake, let's go. Come on, will we have the chance? Nobody needed to be warned a second time. Before the professor had finished speaking, the pimply-faced boy took off on the dead run across the field. Fergie and the professor galloped toward the house, and the crunching sounds they heard behind them made them run even harder. They didn't stop until they were standing on the shadowy front porch of the house. Is it, is it coming to get us? Or is it coming after us? Asked the professor. He was holding his side and wincing with pain. Fergie looked. The hulking moonlit figure was plodding along at a steady pace through the tall grass. Apparently the robot did not believe in hurrying. As soon as he had caught his breath, the professor dashed into the house with Fergie right beside him. The rooms were empty and dark and there was no sound. Sudden despair filled the professor's heart. Had they come to the wrong place? Then, as he was struggling to fight back tears, he heard it. A small sound, a distant clicking and clattering. It seemed to be coming from down below in the basement. Come on, yelled the professor as he grabbed Fergie's arm. We've got to find the kitchen, I mean the cellar door. Follow me. They stumbled down a dark hallway, bumping into doors on the way. In the distance, moonlight was shining on a warm linoleum, on a worn linoleum floor, and that guided them. Once they had reached the kitchen, Fergie and the professor began looking wildly around. One door opened into a closet, and another led to the pantry. Where was the door that led to the basement? Then, as he paused in the middle of the room, the professor looked down. A linoleum-covered door lay at his feet. With a yell, he dropped to his knees and grabbed the little ring that served as a doorknob. Pulling the heavy door back, the professor peered down into the blackness. He could just barely make out a rickety flight of steps. Carefully, he began to pick his way down, and Fergie followed. The basement smelled musty and damp, and it was absolutely pitch dark except for one thing. A tiny pencil-thin line of light could be seen over in one corner. Groping his way forward, the professor found that he was standing in front of a set of wooden shelves that was full of mason jars. The light was coming from a crack in a wooden door that stood behind the shelves. Furiously, the professor hurled jars this way and that, and the basement was filled with the sound of breaking glass. With Fergie's help, he heaved the shelves sideways and kicked open the door. Fergie and the professor stopped in the doorway, and they stared. Before them lay a rock-walled room that was lit by three oil lamps. On a table lay Johnny, stiff and still and deathly pale, and near him stood the old man from the gas station. He was wearing a white smock and rubber gloves, and in one hand he held a glittering sharp scalpel. The other hand clutched a mirror. You dirty dog, screeched the professor, and he rushed at the man, knocking him backward across the marble top stand. Instruments clattered to the floor, and the glass jar full of moss shattered. The old man fell, but he sprang nimbly up with the scalpel still in his hand. He lunged at the professor, but he missed, and suddenly the professor was on him, hammering at him, hammering at his midsection, yelling all sorts of unpleasant things. The old man crumbled. The professor's foot came down on his wrist, and the scalpel fell from his fingers. There! snarled the professor fiercely. His face bent red, and he was breathing hard. His face was beat red, and he was breathing hard. You rotten 14th rate! Excuse for a human being, he roared. I'll fix you. By the eternal powers, I will. The old man lay on the floor, cowering. Please, please don't kill me, he said in a quavering voice. The professor glanced down, and then he turned away. Fergie was standing by the table, his hand on Johnny's heart. With fear in his eyes, he looked up. He's alive, prof, said Fergie. I mean, his heart's beating, but he's out cold. What do you think that old crad did to him? He's probably fainted from sheer terror, snapped the professor, 
and he may be drugged. Can you lift him? We'll just have to try this. We'll just have to try to... The professor's voice died away. From the dark basement that lay beyond the doorway came the sound of crunching glass. Heavy footsteps moved closer, and then the robot came lurching into the lamplit room. Its large blue eyes were lit by an evil, insane glow. As soon as he saw the thing, the old man let out a blood-curdling yell and scrambled to his feet. He stood cowering against the wall and then covered his face with his hands. Oh, my lord, no, he sobbed. No, no, what have you fools done? What have you done? And that is the end of chapter 11.